Good morning. We're here at uh, Temple Baptist Church in Popper Bluff, Missouri to study for a Sunday school lesson entitled Pick Up Your Mat. It is out of your Explore the Bible lesson for the winter edition to that. Uh, our texts come from the book of John, chapter 5, verses 5 through 16. It will be with the man that had the uh, infirmity for 38 years as he would lay there at the pool of Bethesda, uh, hoping to be healed. At least I would assume that's what he was there for. And so uh, if you need a Sunday school book, uh, you can call the church at 573-785-1250. Uh, they can get that to you, but we thank you uh, for just uh, being with us at the moment as we're uh, studying this lesson. As we said, we're out of John chapter 5, book of St. John, fourth book of the gospel writings of the New Testament. And part of the background in the first four verses, you would learn that uh, this was a uh, day when Jesus would come to Jerusalem. It was uh, one of the feasts they had. It was a holy day. Uh, they would come there to the pool of Bethesda, which is in the northeast corner of the city there by the Sheep Gate. Uh, depending on who you want to talk to for background, uh, it was where people gathered because uh, the temple was close by, whether it was to uh, wash and clean themselves from traveling and coming to the city, uh, it was been close to for the sacrificial system, so they could have had a cleansing for that, depending on what commentary that you read. One of the things that I found also interesting here, there would have been Jews and Gentiles alike around the pool uh, for different religious backgrounds and believing that when the water got stirred or there was a bubbling, if you will, uh, there at the pool that the first one that could reach it uh, was the one that got healed. Um, from my way of understanding, I guess there had to be those that were healed. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had that hope in the first place. But So that was a setting, sitting here at the pool of Bethesda, waiting and hoping to get healed when they would see the stirring of the water. The man uh, that we see that got healed that day and made whole had been there for 38 years, according to the passage that we will read. Um, our writer in the commentary would say about the Gihon Spring that would be there, and I've read others that there was a reservoir in the aqueducts that would come into the city. Uh, also hear that uh, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, that people would begin to build large open-air pools that served as reservoirs for the city's growing population, and so here was the Pool of Bethesda located north of the Temple Mount. And on his way to Jerusalem, that is Jesus, for that uh, unspecified festival, that holy day, says that Jesus found a large number of people that were gathered around the Pool of Bethesda. Located just inside the northeastern wall of the city, the pool offered respite for travelers that would come through that sheep gate. Uh, as we said, namely, Impossible resulted from it being the place where sheep were brought in for sacrifice uh, and there also for the marketplace. As we said, travelers from all the northern territories who stopped to wash and to rest, those that were chronically ill and injured were gathered around the pool, Jews and non-Jews alike. I had one uh, commentator that would say that's why the rabbis and other leaders wouldn't go. They would be considered unclean for those that had been sick and of course for being around non-Jews. Uh, I would say the non-Jews saw it as a healing sanctuary, uh, contributed its powers to Ishman, uh, a Semitic god of healing. Uh, they believed that an angel would stir the water on occasion and the first person to enter then would be healed. As we said, the man that we're talking about today had been lame for 38 years, and then Jesus would tell him to take up his mat and go home. When we look about this, part of today's lesson, as we said, is pick up your mat. Reading a little closer, we see the difference, if there is one, between pity and compassion. 
writer would teach us that pity usually involves a response to a situation where compassion responds to the person. I've got notes from a long time ago that definition for compassion is this. Having sympathy with the desire to do something about it. We can see the situation and have pity about it, but to do something is where compassion comes in. One of the things on this lesson that really touched my heart was that we could see that Jesus, quote unquote, sees that he would have compassion. There's another passage that said that when Jesus looked out on the multitude, he had compassion. That's where we have the feeding of the 5,000 with the young boy's sack lunch. And so let's look then a little closer at today's lesson. The first uh, few verses, 5 through the beginning of verse 9, reads us this way. A certain man was there, which had an infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew that he'd been there a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked. This first part of scriptures, there are several things that we can see. Here was a guy that was there, there at the pool of Bethesda, there at the north east side of the, the, the city, inside the gate. For 38 years he was there. and You can read what the writer says about that if you have your book. I would just simply say there he was there quite a long time. Don't know what all he was focused on, if he was focused on the misery that he had. Even in this passage it would say when Jesus asked him, would he be made whole, he came up with excuses. Well, you know, I don't have anybody to help me get there. And when I try to get there on my own, somebody else beats me there. And so he was definitely focused on his infirmities that was there. But look at what it says about what our Lord did. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been there a long time, he talked to him. He didn't just look at him and say, well, he's been there. He can uh, probably cause Tim's own self to get there. We have to remember that there were several times, I think it'll come back in our lesson, that even the disciples of Jesus, along with others, uh, there was when the blind man was there, the disciples asked, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents, so they could be born blind? And so there's always been that connection, if you will, of people, especially of Jews and, and of others, that, hey, he must have done something to be this way. My husband of Lazarus, if I get it right, that Jesus said this could be here and that he was there so that you might see the power of God. But nonetheless, here was the man. When Jesus saw him and asked that question and, and asked him if he would be made whole, he gave the excuses and Jesus' response simply would be to rise, take up your bed, and walk. Here at the pool, this guy was there for 38 years. And whether in the pool, there almost four decades would have had to seem like eternity to be longing for relief. John here doesn't describe the man's disability, evidently though it was some type of paralysis or weakness, that rendered this guy unable to maneuver. When Jesus saw him, he knew that he was disabled, and he had been there a long time. In John's Gospel, we see two signs, two miracles, that Jesus performed before this. Now, And those were at the request of somebody else. Remember the last time that I taught this, that at the uh, wedding feast there that it was Jesus' mother that asked him to turn the water into wine, or turn to at least provide the wine for the wedding when they'd run out. Here, Jesus initiated the conversation with this man. He held the conversation by asking him if he wanted to be healed. 
This question is a reminder that some people become comfortable in their miserable. Others who suffer can be overcome with a sense of hopelessness. And so was likely the case for this disabled man. But look at his response. The man's response indicated that he didn't know who Jesus was or that what he could do. Rather, his focus, uh, focusing on Jesus' ability, the man there fixated upon his own disability. As we said, he explained why he had not been able to make it into the water and to be healed, for he didn't have no one, no man to put him into the waters when it stirred. And standing before him, though, was the one who could only and could both help him and heal him, yet he didn't know who Jesus was. Kind of like that, he's always that close, only just a prayer away. And he looks and has compassion for you and I. In larger letters, the writer would say and want to remind us that rather than focusing on Jesus' ability, that the man fixed his own eyes upon his own disability, fixated upon that. May that be a lesson for us. We go through things in this life. We don't have to look very far to, to see. And when we think about ourselves, we don't have to look very far to see others that are going through uh, same things and sometimes even worse. But we also remember that we have a God that can do all things. That Jesus was saying to us in uh, Matthew chapter 11, towards 28 through the rest of the chapter, that all you that labor and heavy laden, if you come to me, I'll give you rest to take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Praise God for a Savior who sees and has compassion to do something and wants to do something about it. It would also teach us with this section that believers should not ignore persons who are in need simply because they've suffered for a long time. Too often we dismiss such sufferers with the idea that they could improve their own selves. Like the man in this story, many people, including the unborn, have no one to help them. For God puts us in their past by divine appointment so that we can be His channel of blessing. May we help and not be hard-hearted uh, and have compassion for those that are around us. The power of Jesus can heal. It can change lives. It's not limited to external or physical circumstances. Here He spoke those three commands. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. No excuses. This time the man offered no excuses. He didn't moan anymore about his condition. Instead, he responded in faith. He was able to obey. And that obey immediately because Jesus had made him well. He took up his mat and he left. When we go through this and there's a lot of things that we're here when we get into our next section that uh, the Mishnah with the Jewish leaders about 200 AD we come up with a lot of uh, laws oral uh, laws that would govern the Sabbath day let me read you just a few here that uh, is in the back of your book uh, starting with page 127 I thought a couple of these interesting that kind of help us see the mindset of the leaders and perhaps the people that day. Uh, a schoolmaster could watch his students read, but he could not read. Uh, a woman could walk around her own courtyard with false hair, but she could not walk around the streets in it. Uh, a man couldn't wear nail-studded wooden shoes on the Sabbath because it would be constituted as plowing on the Sabbath. Here's one. Untying a knot was forbidden if it required both hands. Uh, rabbis disagreed whether or not a crippled person whose leg was cut off could go out with his wooden stump. Um, several there of those things. Uh, when it came to your bed, beds were to be spread prior to the Sabbath for on the Sabbath day. Uh, but not on the Sabbath for the night following the Sabbath. Um, 
You couldn't even fill a dish with oil and a wick in it and put it close to a lamp so that one may have it to light. You couldn't even bury an egg in hot sand or the dust or on the road to cook it. All these things constituted being uh, about labor and doing that. So on the Sabbath, uh, it wasn't allowed. The next scriptures in our passage would say on the same day, it was a Sabbath when this miracle happened. And so the Jews said uh, unto him that was cured, this is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to even carry your bed. Remember, Jesus told him to rise, take up your mat, and go. So by their law, he couldn't even carry his bedroll. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up your bed and walk. And so they asked him, What man is this that told this unto you to take your bed and walk? And he that was healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away in the multitude that was there in that place. So a situation that the man didn't know who it was. It's kind of ironic that even before when Jesus came to him and said, hey, do you want to be made whole? He didn't ask who he was. And then I find it ironically afterwards, when he rose up and took his mat, he didn't ask Jesus then who he was that had healed him. This miracle that John records uh, changes quite a bit of things from here on in the gospel. But here we see it happened on the Sabbath day. As we said, it committed a violation of the Jewish law, the business about carrying uh, goods and certain things. Uh, but rather than show compassion, and I find that through the scriptures here quite a bit, the Jews didn't say, hey, here was a guy that was there for 38 years and now he's standing in front of us. He wasn't able to do that. Instead of praising God and giving glory, they focused on how the guy violated their religious beliefs and their practices. The writer would say that behavior is a reminder of how that we can easily get our eyes off people and miss our opportunities to show care and concern, especially those that are hurting and those that are wounded. I just say we just have a tendency to just get our eyes off Jesus. May we look for those divine opportunities that, and be able to share our faith and pray and see what God can do as He would comfort all of mankind. As we said, hearing the Jews' criticism, this guy would say that the reason he was carrying Matt was because somebody told him to pick up his bed and walk, and so he did that. He didn't want to come into the crosshairs, the writer would say, of these religious authorities, so he blamed Jesus for his healing. They wanted to know, those Jews that were there, what was this man and what is that that he said? Their question then itself sounds like an accusation. As we said, their concern wasn't about the random man who had violated the Sabbath. They wanted to know about the man who had the audacity to instigate this disobedience. Ryder would say they saw him being Jesus as the greater threat. Still trying to claim innocence, we see incredibly that the unnamed man had shown no interest in asking Jesus' his name either before or after the healing. He was so concerned with the miracle that he forgot about the miracle worker. Sometimes God chooses to heal supernaturally without human intervention. At other times, God may choose doctors, medicine, and other uh, physical implements but behind all healing is the great physician. His divine providence, God determines who and how to heal. But in every circumstance, may we recognize it is the Lord at work. We forget that sometimes. I had a, a young man that we've been ministering to and others in our church who uh, got down and, and, and was in a hurting uh, position. And, and so gave him a shelter and, and found work and different things and said, man, you're being blessed. And he said, no, nah. his, his mindset was that this wasn't God that did it, that we were just doing it for him. May we always 
put her eyes on the source where all good things come from. When we get into our lesson and to the last part of it today, it would also teach us that it didn't end with just the man getting up and rising and walking. Verse 14, we continue that afterwards, after the Jews had talked to him, after they questioned him and had the accusations about who this man was that made him whole, it said that Jesus would find him in the temple. And he would say to him, Behold, you are made whole, sent whole to sin no more, lest a worse thing would come upon thee. The man departed and then told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. When we look at this scripture a little more and then the rest of the book of John, I would encourage you, especially this chapter, uh, to read what else would happen. But it would teach us then that when Jesus would see him, he found him there at the temple and he said, Behold, you are made whole to sin no more. As we said earlier in this lesson today, that it was generally believed that suffering was related to sin, that if a person had sinned, that he would suffer. And if a person was suffering, he must have sinned. Uh, writers said Deuteronomy 29 is partly the basis for this, that the Lord's promised blessing for those who obeyed Him and His commands and His cures on those who disobeyed. Or His commands and His curses on those who disobeyed. The connection between suffering and sin was a dilemma that also was faced by Job and his friends. His friends concluded that Job was deceiving himself and trying to deceive others at will when he claimed that he had not sinned. This supposed connection between sin and suffering later, as we read earlier to you or stated earlier, that the disciples would cause to ask Jesus about a blind man. Who did sin, this man or his parents, so this one would be born blind. We see that later in our lessons in John chapter 9. That one, Jesus would explain the condition came so that the words of God might be displayed. Jesus also recognized that sin could lead to suffering, but he did not always connect the two. There was not always a cause and effect relationship, neither did Jesus always disconnect the two. Here, though, he told the man with the warning to sin no more, lest a suffering, a worse thing would be uh, happen. We don't know exactly what. Some would say that uh, perhaps a more debilitating physical uh, situation would be there. Uh, some would say that Jesus is referring to the man's eternal uh, judgment. Don't know that. That's between you and the Lord to have that understanding. When we see his response, though, the man went back to the Jews and told them, who had performed the miracle. He sought him out and had that response for his healing. It would say here in our writer, in doing so, the man that was healed was attempting to integrate himself into the religious authorities. But at the same time, the man's response does indicate something positive. The man reported that it was Jesus who said that which had made him whole. And so doing so, he focused on the man who was a healer. The response of Jews was predictable. Based upon their early accusation question, who is the man, they begin to persecute Jesus. The verb indicates that after this event, they were continually persecuting him. The event here at the Pool of Bethesda and the sequential run-ins with the Jews marked a shift in how John would report the miracles or the signs here in the Gospels. Earlier signs were for the benefit of the recipient. This healing introduced a new thread and hereafter serves as a theme in the gospel. The miracles of Jesus became a point of contention for religious leaders. Rather than rejoicing, the Jewish authorities responded with disapproval, opposition, and ultimately was seeking the death of Jesus. But as a question, why is it sometimes easier to find fault instead of celebrating Jesus working in a person's life? I was a pastor and, and still in ministry, but for 
30 years, and I remember one time that we had a, a young lady that had came to know Christ as her Savior and was just so excited and uh, was a blessing to the church. And one of the deacons said, I'll just give her time. She'll slow down. May we always praise God and continue to do what God would do to have those opportunities to see Him work in His glory in our life. Remember, believers are to offer compassion to all people, that believers can affirm Jesus working in the lives of them and that we can celebrate the works of Jesus. Well, thank you for being with us today. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. I know quite a bit of material that has been here. But may God work in and through you as you see and have compassion uh, to work the works of Jesus to others as He gives you that opportunity. Lord, bless you and all that you do. Amen. Thank you.